Well, there was a written rule in our family growing up when I was a boy, and my mother told me, always marry a girl who cries at movies. So I remember going out on a number of dates and sitting there with tears filling my eyes and looking sideways to see whether she was crying as well. I cry at movies. I'm a bloke, but I cry at movies. I'll tell you one that I have never yet seen that I haven't cried. And did you see it last night? Call the midwife. Man, oh man. Did you see it last night? They had to adopt out that little baby. Oh man. I didn't look to see whether Maxine was crying. I was too embarrassed that I was crying. Do you cry? Uh, TV at our place. Call the midwife. We love it. Doc Martin, we love it. But one series, we actually bought the DVDs. We loved it so much. It's called Rumpole of the Bailey. And Horace Rumpole was a uh, defending barrister in the London law courts, and he used to love to watch him uh, run into stiff, starchy judges in England. Legal drama. I love them. And they grab you, and they grab your attention. The last film we saw was a film called The Duke, which uh, involved the theft of a portrait from the National Portrait Gallery in London. Excellent actors, and it finishes with a cracker of a trial. And although you can estimate what's going to happen in the trial, you're, you're always kept on your toes. There's tension about it. Now, it's like this here. These are fairly dull chapters, I think, in Acts 24 to 26. That's Paul's legal litigation process. But if you look back to chapter 23, so you have to stick with me here if you've got your Bibles there. Come back with me to chapter 23, verse 11, and we are told the outcome of the legal process before it actually begins. God rarely speaks directly, but he speaks directly here. And Dave emphasised this last week, chapter 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him, Paul, and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And so we know that Paul's going to make it through the legal process. Chapter 24, he appears before Felix. Chapter 25, he appears before Governor Festus. Chapter 26, he appears before King Agrippa and Festus and Bernice. So let's very, look very briefly at these court appearances. So let's start in chapter 24. And you notice first the first court appearance that the Jews have got the big guns out. 24 verse 1, the high priest Ananias is there. And the spokesman, the barrister, Chichulis is there as well. And notice their smooth speech as they come to the Roman governor. Since through you we enjoy peace and your foresight, most excellent Felix, has brought many great reforms. We don't want to hold you up too much. Just find this bloke guilty and send him away. But notice verse 5. We've found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among the Jews throughout the world, and is a ringleader of the sect called the Nazareans. And he even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining, you can find this out for yourself. And then Paul comes in, notice in verse 10, and he says, Knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defence here. And he says in verse 12, They didn't find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd in the temple. This is the issue, verse 15. Having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection, both of the just and the unjust. That's why I'm on trial here, because of my faith in the resurrection. Have a look down to verse 21. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial with you this day. Now notice that Paul, Luke doesn't leave the account here because we see that Governor Felix, look down to verse 24, he's married to this lady Drusilla, who's the daughter of Herod and the, her brother is King Agrippa. And they keep coming back to Paul in his imprisonment because they're tantalised by what he, wants to, what, he, what he has to say. But Luke also tells us that uh, Felix might have been looking for a bribe. But look at verse 25. As Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control and coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Now why would the Apostle Paul be talking about righteousness, self-control and coming judgment? Because Felix was married to this, his third wife, Drusilla. And there was some question about the integrity of the marriage. There was some question about to whom Drusilla was married before she came to Felix and how Felix got her. 
And so Paul is saying there is an accounting and he speaks about righteousness. He speaks about self-control and he speaks about the finality of the coming judgment. Chapter 25, he now comes before Festus. The Roman governors, of course, live on the coast in Caesarea. Uh, the troublesome hotspot is up in Jerusalem. And the Jews asked the new governor, would you please transfer Paul from Caesarea, send him back up to Jerusalem? And verse 3 tells you that they're motivated because they were planning to ambush, ambush them on the way and perhaps kill Paul. But Paul makes it quite clear he does not know Festus. But he says, verse 10, I am standing now before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews, I've done nothing wrong, as they know very well. If I'm a wrongdoer, I don't, I, 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 I don't want to escape death. But there is, if there is nothing to their charges against me, you cannot give me up to them. And as a Roman citizen, notice he says in verse 11, I appeal to Caesar. I appeal to the Supreme Court. And that's in Rome. And so Festus says, then to Caesar you shall go, if that's where your appeal is. Now, and of course, uh, Festus must provide a covering letter for the Apostle Paul to explain the case to Caesar for when Paul gets to Rome. And so he's got King Agrippa there, the son of Herod, and Agrippa's wife, Bernice. And so now Luke tells us the third time Paul gives his defence before these people, before of, of, of his experience. Now, in all my years of lecturing on Acts, sometimes students might say, do you think Luke was married, the author of Acts? I say, I'm sure Luke was married, and I'm sure he had lots of children as well. How do you know that? I don't know, but whenever he says anything important, he says it three times, and that indicates that he's a father. I'll tell you, once, twice, three times. Three times he tells us about the coming of the Spirit. Three times about the letter from the Jerusalem Council. Three times about the conversion of Saul Paul on the Damascus Road. And here is the third time. And I want you to notice here that the Apostle Paul gives this defence to Agrippa and to Festus. And where does Festus stop him? Now, it's interesting that the Jews, the religious, stopped him in Acts 22 when he talked about the gospel going beyond the Jews to the Gentiles. Religious are always concerned about parochialism. These are our blessings. Don't share them with anyone else. But here is the secularist, Festus. Where does he stop Paul? All Romans believe that when you die, you go back to the state you were in before you were conceived. <laughs> Nothing. Now look at what the Apostle Paul says. Verse 23 of chapter 26. That the Christ must suffer and that by being, notice, the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to the Gentiles. They would already mentioned the Gentiles before. This really gets up the nose of Festus. And he, in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great teaching is driving you insane. That's what he said. He could not stand the fact that Paul would say that beyond the grave, there was life. There was accounting. Look back at verse 8. It's a great verse, isn't it? Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? This morning we had the announcement of Levi's birth. Where was Levi 10 months ago? Nowhere. That that which is nothing becomes something? Well, why is it a lesser miracle that that which is something becomes something again? That's resurrection. When I was at university, I did a subject called cosmology. Very popular. There were five of us in the class. And the lecturer invited us into his study to have the lectures. And I remember the week he was talking about Pythagoras. Now, I thought that's hypotenuse and all that stuff. And this bloke says, if I weren't a Christian, I'd be a Pythagorean. And I'm sitting there thinking, why would anybody want to be a Pythagorean? But the student next to me said... Why would you be a Christian? I'm thinking, why would you be a Pythagorean? This student says, why would you be a Christian? And he said, oh, I'm a Christian because I'm an historian and I cannot explain the resurrection of Jesus in any other way but that he rose from the dead. Now back to Pythagoreanism. How do you account? Why do you say that it is incredible that God can raise the dead? He has raised the dead. He has raised the first and by raising the first, it is indicative of the many. 
King Agrippa, verse 27, I know that you believe the prophets. And so Paul could have quoted the prophets to him. Paul could have quoted Isaiah. His kingdom will reign forever. Paul could have quoted Isaiah. He is the suffering servant who will see the light of his life. Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Short time or long, Paul says in verse 29, I would that everybody listening to me, including you, be as I am. Except, of course, for these chains. I wouldn't wish them on anyone. Paul never loses his evangelistic zeal. Three appearances, and I want you to notice the verdict. Now, come back with me, if you would, to chapter 23, where Paul comes from the Roman garrison in Jerusalem. And in chapter 23, Lysias, the commander of the Roman garrison in, in Jerusalem, in his covering letter for the Apostle Paul, in 23 verse 29, notice what he says. He writes, I found, verse 29 of 23, that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. So I couldn't find any basis to his guilt. Now flip over to chapter 25, verse 25, and notice what Festus has to say, the governor. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. Now come with me to chapter 26, verse 31, and listen to King Agrippa. They said to one another, verse 31, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. Now, I know enough from watching legal dramas on television that there's such a thing as double jeopardy. A person cannot be tried for the same crime twice. But notice here, there is a threefold declaration here of innocence. Paul has done nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. In other words, Paul knows that there's solidarity between himself and the gospel, that if there is a shadow of criminality over Paul, then they will treat his message as criminal and untrue as well. But there is no such shadow over the gospel. Three times the apostle Paul is declared guiltless. Now, I don't know if you remember Alan Jones. He used to be on 2GB in the mornings. On one occasion, Alan Jones was charged with naming an underage child who was involved in a trial. He went to court, he was found guilty. He was fined and he was given a criminal record. He appealed and he won the appeal. What troubled him was not the fine, but the criminal record. He didn't want the criminal record as a shadow hanging over himself and the integrity of his radio program. There is no such criminal record hanging over our apostle and hanging over the gospel. Now, come with me back, if you would, to Luke chapter 23. So, big flip now, about 20 pages. Same author, Luke, now another legal trial. Here, it is before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, and here it involves the Lord Jesus. Luke chapter 23, verse 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no guilt in this man. That's one. Verse 14. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And then Luke, the author, makes the point in verse, 32, verse 22. A third time he said to them, Why, what evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. Three times the Lord Jesus is declared to be guiltless. Three times the Apostle Paul in parallel with the Lord Jesus is to be declared, declared guiltless. God is in control. God will bring about the redemption of his people and God will make sure that his gospel will reach through to Rome. Now, no criminal shadow, therefore. The question I have as I come to this section of Acts is, Paul is about my age. He's getting on. What keeps him going? Have you ever been to court? I've been to court once. It was a land and environment court. I was arguing for a development approval for a building that was going up at SMBC. I'd never been to court before. 
there was a magistrate up the front, and down there, there was a bloke called a barrister, and he was waiting on my every word. He was waiting to cross-examine me. This court, he was at home. He virtually lived there. He knew his way around this court. I didn't know my way around this court at all. I'd never been there before. And I found it an emotionally draining experience to go to court. What kept Paul going? Through one, two, three court cases. Well, he makes it quite clear, doesn't he? Throughout, chapter 24, verse 15, I believe in the resurrection of both the just and the unjust. I stand here, if you look at chapter 26, let's just stay there. He said, I stand here, verse 6, because of my hope. Verse 8, why do any of you think that it is incredible that God should raise the dead? And then verse 23, it is the resurrection of the dead. He is the first, and he is the first of many. Elsewhere, Paul says that if there's no resurrection, there's nothing to preach. If there's no resurrection, you've got nothing to believe. If there's no resurrection, we are all people to be pitied. If there's no resurrection, there's no point in being here. If there's no resurrection, do you believe it? That's my question. Do you believe it? And do you live it? Now, I believe it. And yet I don't. I mean, in all faith, there's an element, a residue of unbelief, isn't there? Yes, I believe Jesus rose from the dead. Do you believe you'll rise from the dead and stand before him? Yes. <laughs> but there's a residue of unbelief there. And the reality is I need the Holy Spirit's help. Lord, help me in my unbelief. I believe and yet... Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I find it hard. It's always hard. Now, my friends tell me I believe too much. I know that I believe too little. This is true because if he rose first, there'll be many to come. So my question to you today is a very personal one. Do you actually believe this? Do you recite it and is it real? I can remember on one occasion when we were in our first parish and for some reason... Uh, Maxine had gone to Canberra with the kids to visit her father, who was not well. And there was a women's weekly lying around the house. So I picked it up and started to read it. And I read about this person who had this terrible disease. And I thought, I've got some of these symptoms. So I went down to the local GP, who was a member of our congregation, and I said, Rick, do you think I've got this? And he said, I, I expected. He'd say, don't be silly. But he didn't. He said, Dave, I think that's a very real possibility. Oh, good grief. And then I went out to the airport to pick Maxine up at the airport at Wee War, and Rick drives up next to me in the car next to me, and I think he's come to tell me he's only joking. <laughs> he gets out of the car and he's got a big medical book, and he gets in my car next to me. He said, I'm only doing this because you're my friend, and he opens it up to this disease, and he says, look, this is how it's going to progress, and you can have up to 10 years normal life. Oh, thanks very much. That's a Friday afternoon. Well, the word got around and I was preaching Sunday morning. And after I preached the sermon, one of the elders came out from church. And he said, I, I thought you might be interested in this cassette tape of this sermon. And he gave me the tape. The title of the sermon was The Christian's Hope. Preacher, David Cook. Do you believe it? Or you preach it, but now's the time to believe it. Do you actually believe it? Now, that's the question. How real was this for the Apostle Paul? Let's turn back to what I believe, it well, certainly is my favourite verse in all of Acts. Let's have a look at chapter 20, <coughs> verse 24. Chapter 20, verse 24. Um, and notice, in verse 23, the Holy Spirit warns Paul that imprisonment and afflictions await him but then the Apostle Paul says, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to me. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. I don't grasp my life, hold it jealously to me to be preserved at all costs, except as a vehicle for the fulfillment of his calling from the Lord Jesus to testify 
to the gospel of God's grace. In other words, wherever Paul is, whether it's in a cell or before a tribunal or on a boat in a storm, my role, my calling is to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Why? Because Jesus was the first to rise and there will be a general resurrection and we'll all stand before him. Paul knows that the living Jesus has called him. Paul knows that the living Jesus gives him strength. And Paul knows that one day he will stand in the presence of the living Jesus to give an account of his calling. And so will I. And so will you. Preached, lived, recited, real. Imprisonment, litigation, flogging, stoning, jail, storm, shipwreck, snake bite. Your experience mightn't be as colourful as that. But it is the same gospel called to give testimony, the same grace, with the same assurance of resurrection. I want to finish the race. I want to live my life in the light of eternity. And what I love about the Apostle Paul is that he's no superman. He's just like me. He's just like you. But he believed his belief. Do you believe? Here's a lady. She leaves Ireland. She goes to India. She stays in India for 56 years without furlough, without returning to Ireland. At the turn of the last century, she meets her first five-year-old little girl who has been used in ritual prostitution for religion in a temple in India. And she takes that little girl and rescues her in a haven. And Amy Carmichael was the name of this lady, and she provided haven for thousands and thousands of little such, such little girls in India. In her 70s, Amy Carmichael had a fall and was debilitated and couldn't be healed, but she spent her time writing. Now listen to this poem that she wrote. Gone, they tell me, is youth. Gone is the strength of my life. Nothing remains but decline. Nothing but age and decay. Now when I preached at that at nine o'clock this morning, I could feel, yes, yes, they're saying yes. That's right, listen to those words again. Gone, they tell me, is youth. Gone is the strength of my life, oh, hobbling around. Nothing remains but decline, oh, the old knees. Nothing but age and decay. Not so. I'm God's little child, only beginning to live, coming the days of my prime, coming the strength of my life, coming the vision of God, coming my bloom and my power. Why? Because he was the first to rise, and we will too. And so at the age of 84, Amy Carmichael writes her last letter home and she quotes the verse, the poem, that has kept her going all these years. Listen to these words. Green pastures are before me, which yet I have not seen. Bright skies will soon be o'er me where the dark clouds have been. My hope I cannot measure. My path to life is free. My saviour has my treasure and he will walk with me. What keeps you going? It is the reality that he was the first to rise from the dead. Why would you be a Christian? Because I'm an historian and I cannot explain the resurrection in any other way but that it happened. Why do you think it incredible that God raises the dead? Jesus, the first to rise, and we are the many who will follow.